Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name's Jane Secker. And my name's Chris Morrison. And we are the co-chairs of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, a special interest group of the Association for Learning Technology, who host us on these regular monthly webinars. So this is episode number 51, isn't it? It is, it is. And for those who were there before, could see that the, the balloon, the 50 balloon, has been slowly deflating. So it's now... So you added a post-it note to the 50 to make it 51. I did. Uh, I was slightly, somewhat critical of, of that as an you approach, were. but particularly because it wasn't on the other side. Oh, you did it on the other side. I yeah, apologise. It was a great I, idea. I think but, the additional but, weight of the post-it has made it even sadder as it <laughs> falls to the floor. Not in any way a reflection of how... Of the quality of, of the, the quality session. of this session the or any of the other sessions. No, or of the previous 50 if you're tuning in for the first time. This is going to be a good one. It is. So, so what are we doing today? Well, we have got our usual copyright news. Uh, we've got quite a few items that we're going to go through. Lots of exciting things coming up, been happening. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through all of that. Um, and then the focus of today's session is uh, becoming a copyright specialist. So we first did a webinar on this in November last year. Um, we had a really great um, session and we thought this is going to be a kind of regular feature of the webinars to get people in from all different stages of their career. So really, really pleased to have um, Chris from University of Kent, the other Chris. The other Chris. Uh, there, Wendy. There, there are more than one Chris available. There, there are quite a lot of Chris's in the copyright world there as well. Indeed. I yeah. think it's part all of, of them. All of them great in their own ways. Yes. Then we have Wendy from LSE who mm -hmm. will be talking um, about becoming a copyright specialist and Neil Sprunt. Um, who many of you will know from the University of Manchester. So Absolutely. really looking forward to it. So what has been happening since the last time we met? Oh, uh, we've been busy. Yeah, so this is some really great news um, that you may have seen a while back that Jane and I put out a call for some people to help with us and to share in the joy in managing all the stuff we do around copyright literacy. We call the copyright literacy Padawans, those of you who know Star Wars will understand where that comes from. So we're delighted to say that Catherine uh, Drum, who works with Jane at City, Sarah Hammond from the University of Cambridge and Maria Molina, um, some of whom are def certainly with us today, um, have joined our band to help us with various things on the website. And, yeah, it's really uh, exciting. The blog and social media and all sorts of other stuff. So welcome to them um and uh, it's just yeah it's it's fantastic yeah yeah i know definitely we've got catherine and maria on the webinar today as well so Brilliant. that's lovely um and uh yeah we're, we're looking forward to working with them and putting up some more details i think in a blog post very soon yes and we did ask them do they actually want to keep the term padawan so they want to come up with something else so maybe we come up with another term mm. i think sarah suggested minions i don't mm. think that's quite the right one uh, <laughs> so anyway oh i do like a minion i yeah. do i do yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, right. This is the webinar and blog archive, uh, so where you can see previous uh, either the Blackboard Collaborate uh, recordings or the YouTube versions of them, which are now on the website. I'll just and pop Jane, a couple of those into the chat the for you. Oh, oh, I've dropped them. Oh, she's dropped a mouse. Oh, I've dropped okay. Mouse. Oh, right. Oh, so oh, in the meantime, oh. you'll do that without making a fuss, won't you? And we oh, can never, move on never to never the anything, next section, which is of course everyone's favourite. Copyright news. Couldn't play this video. Right, okay. Copyright news jingle coming up with you just any moment now. You could always hum it. I could always hum it. I think it may be because I've taken this. So I'm trying a slightly different way of playing the jingles to you today. Uh, the first one of which worked fine, the next one of which didn't work quite so well. Okay. I think you're going to have to do it. Copyright news, copyright news, copyright news, copyright news, copyright news, copyright news. Okay, that's that one. That's enough of that jingle. Indeed, it is. Okay, so first up um, in the copyright news is um, the fact that we have a very small number of places left at the Icebox conference. So this is just to let you know, this is your final warning. We um, only have 60 places at the conference and we have pretty much sold them all. Mm -hmm. So if you were intending to come, I would recommend you get yourself booked onto the conference very soon because you are likely to miss out. So um, yeah, we've got, I think we've got five or six places left and that is it. And it we have is. to be quite strict on numbers. So. Yes, we've been to visit the room. It's going to be absolutely fantastic, but they have 
a strict limit on number of places. They can come to the after the party. Well, oh, after parties, obviously, welcome to any yeah. copyright chums who happen to find themselves in Oxford. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we have a strict 60 person limit in the room. Uh, so yeah, it, and, and the program is developing as well. Um, yeah, we hope to get that up next week, actually. We do, yeah, some really great. So we've got a really quiet week next week, haven't we? We're not uh, really doing anything at all. We've got like just just a bit of sitting around, I think. And as ever, we've got loads of incredibly crashing deadlines where we're trying to do massively over ambitious things. But hey, would we want it any other way? No. So what are we doing next week, Chris? Well, we are going to. Leicester for the Playful Learning Conference. Indeed, yes. So this has been a long time coming. Um, I, I think the conference bookings have closed. So this is just really to let you know where what we're up to. And we'll probably be um, on Twitter. We may well be sharing some stuff fairly soon after the conference as well, because we've been kind of getting uh, like uh, we've discovered that trying to be really playful is really stressful when you're going to a conference with lots of other people who are really playful so i'm sure it'll be fantastic yeah uh, we're looking forward to it we are looking forward to it um our next item um is uh just to let people know um that the alt conference the bookings are open um for the alt conference which is the week of ice pop so ice pops is the last day of alt and it's at uh alt is at uh, university of manchester so for those of you who've had quite enough of uh copyright or who um have basically missed out on ice pops you could go to the alt conference so it's the association for learning technology it's actually the first conference i ever went to you know i won't tell you what year it was but maybe we could have a competition to guess maybe maybe yeah. um just to say that on the alt c conference there are also online participation options as well so they've done yes. everything that allows you even if you can't would anyone like to guess what year it was i first went uh would you like to guess i think it was 2001. Okay, right. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe reveal that at the end. Okay. We'll see what people what think in the chat. If you've got uh, any any advances on 2001, or if you think I'm even older and you want to go back to the 90s, what have we got next? We'll Chris? Right. What's next? Yes. Um, copyright waffle. I'm wearing the t-shirt. Copyright waffle t-shirt today. Are Many we of you will know about this? it is our podcast series. Yes, we're extremely excited about the podcast that we did with. Mark Lewison, um, at, I think undisputed leading number one Beatles expert mm. um, who spoke to us about the Beatles and copyright in this most recent episode is the second in two part uh, conversation. He talks to us about his archive, about libraries, about um, what's going to happen to his archive. And we about get... the way copyright affects the way he does his research. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is, is just brilliant. And um, one thing that came up in the tour of Mark's archive was the collection or part of the collection he has of uh, John Cura's telly snaps. And this is... I have become unbelievably excited about probably one of the weirdest, nerdiest things ever. Well, taking, I? taking photographs of the television it's... these days doesn't sound that revolutionary, but in the post-war period, it really was. And it comes with a big copyright part of that story because he was doing this and was it or was it not in contravention of well at the, i think law? at the time the 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 law did not cover broadcast did it so the was it what which would have been the act the 1911 it was the 1911 act so clearly yeah. it didn't specifically mention what happens if someone takes photographs of the television and then tries to sell those photos back to the performers and the broadcasters so that is actually in this article that mark wrote a number of years ago that he's allowed us to publish on the copyright literacy website so huge thanks to mark mm. for, for uh, and he's got a creative to, commons license he's on agreed it. to license at creative commons so yeah we are delighted with that so you may want to follow that up we found it fascinating and there are telly telly snaps i just want to say i'm not going to go on and on and on about them but the one of the things that's really interesting is that for live broadcast there at that point there was no other way of recording them other than to take stills yeah. and so there is some events that are captured in telly snaps that um and i think the one that's up on the screen there i believe this is the queen when she was princess elizabeth mm -hmm. watching the fa cup final um at some point in the very early 50s i think so uh, it's just it's just a kind of fascinating um you know, uh, it is it is about copyright history, isn't it? Really, essentially. Yeah. yeah so. Absolutely. So, Diane, thank you. You read the article, found it interesting. Yeah, we're glad you enjoyed it as well.
Yeah, 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 yeah. I try not to get stupidly excited yes, about Teddy Snaps. Let's, move, let's on. move on, because I could probably give a whole lecture about them now. So it might happen one day. Anyway, next up, next up, a, a good friend of ours, um, Leo Haverman, uh, who is um, at UCL, but he's doing his PhD at the Open University um, on open education and open education policy, um, has got a survey out at the moment. And um, we have agreed to just help him promote his survey. So I have popped a link in the chat. We've got it in copyright news. And I think he'd be really grateful if you could complete that. I think the deadline for completing it is still a few weeks away sometime um, in the middle of July so um, but if uh, I think it's you know it's looking for somebody from your institution might not necessarily be you you might want to send it on to your learning technology team but um, it is about your institution's open education policy so that's another good one and finally the final piece of copyright news really is hot off the press and it really is genuine copyright news that the intellectual property office has released the government the government's response the uk government response to artificial intelligence and intellectual property it was a consultation on patents and copyright and how they should help to deliver the benefits of using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the key thing here for copyright, for those of us in our world, is on text and data mining. So for text and data mining, the government plans to introduce a new copyright and database exception, which allows TDM for any purpose. So that's commercial and non-commercial. Rights holders will still have safeguards to protect their content, including a requirement for lawful access. So the devil is in the detail as ever when mm. the legal drafting happens. But this is good news for those of us in the library and research world mm. that have been advocating for the law to be broadened for for a long time now. And, you know, we, we you know, highlighted some of these concerns um, over the years, haven't we, since mm. that exception was brought in. That it's kind of, you know, if you've got technical protection measures in place, then, you know, what's the point of having that exception because it's causing so many problems? Yeah. Um, so, so we expect to see a lot more conversation about this. Almost yeah. certainly there will be events uh, looking at the detail of this. We, it's not necessarily an online learning issue per se. We did look at it as part of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest did, Group, yeah. whether we would uh, put in a response to that consultation. Um, there are artificial intelligence implications, but this is very much about research, but it certainly has, there's always crossover. Yeah. And Alaco and um, RLUK were, were involved in the British mm -hmm. Library and I was part of a group which, which helped draft a response. Um, so hopefully that had um, an impact. But I think, you know, with such a focus on AI as well and some of the, the other kind of challenges um, that, that were being faced, it, it, it's, 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 it sounds, we're mm -hmm. always a bit cautious, but it sounds like good news. It does. So... Right. Let's get started on the main event. So yeah. we are absolutely delighted, as we said, to introduce a, another three presenters talking about their story of becoming a copyright specialist. So we have, in order of appearance, Chris Slater from the University of Kent, Wendy Linwood from LSE, the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, and Neil Sprunt from the University of It's all right to abbreviate. I, just, okay. I, I took an executive decision having worked there 15 years. Yes. That it was going to make it run too long on that slide. It would have. Got, it would have. But yeah. nonetheless, it wouldn't have made it too long to just explain it unless we'd then had a conversation about it afterwards. But no matter. Let us turn, first of all, to Chris. If we can get up Chris's slides. Chris, can we hear you? Can you turn your mic and camera on? Can you hear me? Oh. Can you see me? That would be... We can hear and we can hear you. See you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Good so, start. Chris, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, handing over to you. You're going to talk. Each of our presenters will be talking for 10 minutes. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a conversation for a, an opportunity for a conversation. Yeah. So, absolutely. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, hopefully, this will go <laughs> OK. Um, OK. So, really, uh, Apart from Jane and Chris aside, I, I fully expect that no one else will know who I am. So let's start at the beginning. Who am I and how did I end up talking to you all today? Uh, and those are two questions that I did end up asking myself uh, <laughs> as I was making my presentation, in fact. So as 
as mentioned, I am Chris and I am a copyright licensing policy and risk coordinator at the University of Kent. And it's a very good job that we're not made to wear name badges because the title's so long. Of course, out of all the things that we do, I'm here to talk, or all the things that I do, I'm here to talk to you about copyright. So essentially, my role at the university is to deliver uh, support and guidance uh, to staff and students in, in, in things about copyright, uh, to help maintain and develop our institutional knowledge about copyright and to deliver training where it's required. That's sort of the, the nutshell uh, overview of, of, of what I do in the copyright space at the university. But how did I actually end up here today delivering a talk to you as a someone starting their journey as a, a copyright specialist. Just change the page. So I've rather sort of tongue in cheek named this bit uh, from books to drugs and back to books again. It makes me sound a bit like an off the rails rock star. But uh, so my background is as a historian. I studied for three years at Kent uh, uh, as an undergraduate and I graduated in 2015 and then straight on to do a, a master's in medieval and early modern history and and the picture here actually is from one of my own trips to the national archives uh, it's a 13th century papal bull from gregory the ninth if i'm remembering correctly it was a long time ago now but uh eventually i stopped trying to delay the inevitable and i left the university properly in september 2016 and i did the logical thing for a history uh, a history graduate and i went to work for a pharmaceutical company uh I did various things there. I tried my hand in the warehouse. I did a stint as an accountant and had a play around with business development. And all, all told, I ended up spending about five years uh, at, at that company. Uh, and I didn't really enjoy my time, <laughs> my time there. So in October 2021, I applied for a job as a licensing and policy administrator at the University of Kent. And spoiler alert, I got the gig. You'll notice though, that within that title, there's no mention of copyright. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But the main point that I'm trying to emphasize is that I clearly have absolutely no background in copyright at all. Ooh, there we go. So the journey begins, or does it? I started at Kent in uh, November of 2021. And as I said, copyright wasn't really a sort of a part of the role that I was going to be doing initially. Um, it was it was certainly not going to be a significant part of my role, at least maybe I would have been expected to dabble, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't there uh, as a, a formal sort of part of my, part of my job description. All of that changed very quickly though, as I found myself joining the university midway through a major departmental restructure. So a couple of weeks into the job, I was told that starting in February this year, February, 2022, I was going to be the university's copyright coordinator. I was on my way. So down the rabbit hole. Now I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I've said that my journey started in November 2021, but that's not entire uh, in February 2022 rather. Sorry, but that's not entirely true. And if the, if this was a film, they'd probably play that sound effect, you know, the record scratch for the backtracking. I mean, as I said, I was going to formally take on the role of copyright coordinator in February 2022, but my exposure to the copyright space had actually begun probably around the time that I actually started started in the role. And as is perhaps inevitable when you're working literally two foot away from Chris Morrison. The actual beginning of my journey into the copyright domain uh, begun as a series of conversations and a recommendation to watch a video, uh, the 2021 Charles Clark Memorial Lecture on AI and Copyright. And I'm quite pleased that that's actually really topical given <laughs> given the news this week. So I'm, I'm glad I got that one in there. And I, I do hope to share the link to that uh, for anyone that wants to see it, because I would definitely recommend uh, people uh, giving it a view if you haven't seen it already. It was while watching uh, this lecture and uh, enjoying sort of the conversations that I was able to have with Chris about sort of the themes and the topics that had come up in, in in that lecture that I found that I was beginning to develop an interest and and, and I know that sounds a little bit cliched but it really was quite sort of an, a, a, an epiphany sort of moment that I, I, I found the seeds of uh, hunger for copyright developing I suppose you could say. You know, from that point onwards I found myself beginning to learn, you know, um, 
this was before I was formally expected to sort of take on the duties of a copyright coordinator, but I was picking things up by familiarizing myself with the university's guidance, conversations with Chris. Uh, I eventually got involved in the delivery of advice and uh, guidance. And before I knew it, I was helping to sort of provide training and assist with the development of policy. So I sort of jumped the gun in terms of actually stepping into that role. I grew and I continue to grow by essentially doing the job. So that's effectively in a nutshell how I actually ended up <laughs> as a copyright coordinator. Now, you know, uh, I, I, I do the role uh, largely autonomously. I'm still learning, still developing. Uh, but the, the core sort of the functions that I mentioned earlier about the delivering of support and guidance, helping to develop policy, deliver training. Those are all the sorts of things that I do in my sort of business as usual, day to day role as a, as a copyright coordinator, amongst the, the many other things that I also do on top of that. So I have some food for thought or tips for people like me. So if you are if you are just starting out in the in this space and you're, you're stepping into the world of copyright for the first time, the easiest thing to do would be to get yourself a Jane Secker or Chris Morrison, but uh, we're not all so lucky to be able to <laughs> have them on hand. So what are the actual things that you really can do yourself? And I think the first thing, and it's maybe easier said than done, is have an interest. And it might take you some time to, to realize that interest for you to sort of grasp, actually, you know, it is an area that is truly deeply fascinating and you can go down all sorts of rabbit holes with it. And it did, <laughs> it did take me some time myself. I, uh, it was never something that I saw myself being interested in. You know, I hadn't had a background in it, nor had I ever really thought about the topic of copyright very often. One of the other things that I think you can do is read. And although there are sort of uh, avenues that you can go down to introduce sort of uh, to formalize your learning, you can take on courses and do all sorts of things in that in that sort of space. But if you're not yeah, able to sort of uh, undertake a course or, or, or you're, you're not you're not looking to do that just yet for people for people like me who, who need structure to their learning I found that reading is a really useful is a really sort of useful way of organizing uh, and collecting your thoughts uh, in that space so I, I try to take time to uh, to read in my spare time to just uh, you know try to 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 uh, introduce some sort of proper structure uh, and routine to, to my development in, in, in copyright knowledge. Um, be curious would certainly be another tip uh, that I would that I would uh, advise people on. That would be, you know, joining things like the the discussion lists. So Liz CopySeq is a really good resource for sort of just seeing what's going on in, in the sector uh, and seeing what other issues people are are dealing with looking into their questions and and hopefully i'll get to the stage where i can help people with some of those um go to events and don't be afraid to ask lots and lots and lots of questions you know it's it's whatever works for you is is going to be the best approach but just don't be afraid to try and actively expand your knowledge it it, it takes a bit of proactivity i think is is, is probably the key thing and the last thing that I would probably say in this on that front is not to be intimidated as well. I mean, I understand that and certainly in my experience, copyright can be a very daunting topic. There's an awful lot and there's a lot of complex interactions and thought processes and philosophies that go into it. And there's going to be an awful lot that you won't know. And, and, and I doubt anyone will ever get to the point where they know everything there is to know about copyright. but I would say be patient with yourself, be, go easy on yourself and and allow yourself time and space uh, to learn at a pace that works for you. It's not a race. You don't have to be anywhere with it. Uh, you know, just take time, try to enjoy yourself and, and, and always remain curious. Um, so that that that's 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 what I have to say. Um, and I'll, I'll share that link. Uh, 
but I'm happy to take any questions, whether we do that now or later. Um, Thanks so much, Chris. That was fantastic. What we'll do is we'll we'll have questions and discussion at the end. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to say thank you again. Um, and also reflecting on my experience of having brought you in and having to introduce you to some of these difficult topics. And then abandoning it. And then about, well, not exactly about yeah, well. <laughs> uh, While know, he was down that rabbit hole, you disappeared, you hopped off. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, you've, you've done a really great job in the time that you've been there and picking things up and asking all those questions. Mm. Um, so actually for me, it was an exercise in letting go of some of that. Everything needs to come to one person thing. So there are some perhaps things to discuss quite deep. later. Before we, we get any deeper down that rabbit hole, shall yeah. we move on to the to the next presenter? But thanks again, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks you. so much. Okay, so next up, our next speaker um, in um, this exciting topic of becoming a copyright specialist um, is um, Wendy Linwood. Um, Wendy is um, at the London School of Economics, my former place of work, more than five, more than five years ago now. Um, but um, really looking forward to what you've got to say, uh, Wendy, about becoming a copyright specialist. So there's your slides and take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, and I'm glad to say... <laughs> All through Chris's talk, I've just had um, there's a, a tree shredder opposite my house that's uh, that's been making a, a great racket and it has just stopped. So fingers crossed uh, that stays off. Um, so yes, becoming a copyright specialist, and I'm a little bit further along the line than Chris, but I would say the emphasis is still very much on um, becoming um, rather than feeling that I am a copyright specialist. Um, but I thought I would just start. Um, with a little bit about my career path. I'm a little bit longer in the tooth than Chris as well, so um, I have a bit more of a, a, a history to me. Um, so my first job um, post qualification was in a law firm in uh, the city of London, SJ Berwyn. Um, and despite the, you know, Fortnum and Mason hampers that we were given at Christmas and the, the swanky parties, um, I decided that really the corporate world wasn't for me. Um, and so I took the opportunity to move uh, into academic libraries with a year's contract at the LSE. Um, and that was to cover somebody who was on secondment during the refurbishment of, of the library. Um, when that contract came to the end, um, I was lucky in that the law librarian post at Middlesex University um, came up. So I made the, the hop up to Hendon um, to become the law librarian there. And I would say that in all those three posts, um, my Copyright just wasn't really on the radar. So my knowledge of and interaction with copyright just, just didn't really feature. Um, <clears throat> so after Middlesex, um, I was lured back to central London um, and went to Birkbeck. Um, as many of you know, that's the, the institution that caters for part-time mature students, um, teaching mostly in the evening. Um, and again, I was a subject librarian for law. You can see there's a bit of a theme developing in my career here. Um, as well as for the departments of criminology and psychosocial studies. And it was at Birkbeck, I think, that my, my copyright awakening began. Um, so I was there really when the digitization of materials really began to take off. So the idea that you would provide um, chapters and extracts from books um, and so on to different modules within the BLE. So most of my interaction um, there was around the CLA license and, and explaining what that meant to academic staff. Um, whilst at Birkbeck for some years, I also um, managed the library's disability and dyslexia team. So clearly copyright had an impact there as well. Um, and the, the sort of reforms in 2014 were really welcome um, in that context. So having been at Birkbeck a very long time and uh, being in danger of becoming part of the furniture, um, I decided maybe it was time for a new challenge. Um, and so the post at the LSE was advertised, so the law librarian and copyright officer. So clearly I saw that and thought, yes, I can, I, I am a law librarian, I can do that. But the copyright bit, far less confident with that, but you know, that could be the challenge that I'm looking for. So I was interviewed at LSE in um, early March 2020, and I joined in June. Um, and clearly in those few months, the world turned upside down. So the job I thought I was going to and the way I thought I would start was you know, very different from the reality. So I was kind of getting to meet everybody online. I didn't set foot on campus for quite some time. So that was really challenging. Um, 
I think the other thing I found challenging was the fact that um, there hadn't really been anyone with a copyright brief um, for around three years, I think, before I started. Um, and of course, who had had that brief before me? Uh, none other than Jane Secker. So that was also quite daunting uh, to come in knowing that I didn't know that much about copyright um, and that Jane yeah, obviously does. Um, so yeah, that was, that was another thing to kind of contend with um, amongst it all. Um, so clearly I had to try and get up to speed um, and we all have to try and keep up to date. And the kind of methods I use for both are quite similar. So clearly I realized that uh, my knowledge in this area needed a boost. Um, and pretty much the first thing I did was sign up to this CopySeq, um, which was a very wise decision. Um, and that has been um, a real um, source of um, inspiration and, um, and so on. I read, so Chris was um, mentioning about reading. Um, I think in the early flush of enthusiasm, I did actually read the copyright and e-learning book um, cover to cover, um, but I also plugged into, into other books. Um, I'm a law librarian, we have Oxford Law Trove. So just looking at the copyright parts within um, intellectual property textbooks and so on as well, um, I found helpful. Um, I found key sites and, and bookmarked them. Um, so things obviously like the IPO, um, copyright user, you know, government websites and so on. Um, and I still go back and refer to those. Um, I'm a fan of the email newsletter. So um, I signed up to receive emails on anything that looked vaguely relevant. Um, so things I have copy, uh, Creative Commons um, newsletters coming through, things from Europeana, um, Create. So yeah, so that's another way that I try and, and stay up to date. Now, I'm a bit of a lurker on Twitter. So there's a theme here. I lurk on this CopySeq by and large, and I lurk on Twitter, um, but I have followed a number of accounts. So again, um, organizations, but also individuals such as Charles Oppenheim um, and Naomi Korn. Um, IP Cat, uh, I find really useful as well. So that's, that's another way of, of kind of keeping up to speed. And then everything else, I just anything I come across, whether it's blog posts, articles, policy documents, they all go into my Mendeley um, folder, which could do with a bit of curating. Um, but I know that if I've seen it, then the likelihood is um, I can come back to it um, through Mendeley. And of course, the webinars have, have been a real boon, um, both in terms of um, expanding my knowledge about copyright, um, but also about, about keeping up to date. So those have been extremely useful. So who asks for copyright advice and what do they ask? I'm sure this is very similar um, in everyone's institution. So really it's a real mix. I'm not going to read through the slide, but it's a mix of, of staff within the library. Um, so from different teams in the library because copyright impacts on so much. Um, academic staff, certainly when I first joined, um, because of the pandemic, I think concerns around what could and couldn't be done with um, media, so streaming video and so on, um, was a sort of often used, often asked question. Um, LSE students are very ambitious, so from master's students upwards, really, they, they talk about publishing um, their dissertations and theses. Um, so we talk not just about their, their use of third party copyright, but also being aware of their rights and what they might be giving away if they assign uh, copyright to a publisher. Um, and other than that, just various questions, often around the use of images, actually, from around the school. Um, so both about the correct use of Creative Commons images, Flickr, we've had some brushes with uh, problems with licenses that um, uh, are licensed under earlier versions. Um, and then external users, because we have these great national collections and um, a really excellent archive. We do get quite a lot of reuse requests from that as well. Um, quite often we don't own the copyright and we have to explain that, um, but we do get a fair amount of interest um, because of that as well. Okay, so in the past two years, um, what has surprised me about copyright? Um, I think, firstly, it's, it's reach. I don't think I fully appreciated before how it underpins so much of what the library does and also what the institution does. So whether it's teaching or research related or considering our own um, collections and our own IP and how we share things, um, it, really, it really kind of goes everywhere. Um, so that's that's the first thing that I've learned about it. 
Um, the second thing was actually the amount of time I've spent working with other teams within the library and beyond. I think I had this view of I might get a few email questions and write a bit of guidance and, and that would be that, but it's been a lot more than that. Um, there's a lot of expertise actually in the library already within archives, within research support um, and so on. But I think what people often are looking for is just somebody to talk things through with um, and just have that reassurance really um, that they're not you know, a million miles away um, from what we think we should be doing. Um, and the last thing probably will not come as a surprise to anybody here, but actually it's, it's nowhere near as dull as its reputation suggests. So as we know, it's really fast changing. I mean, we only have to look at the, you know, the recent um, government um, consultation, which has just been reported on to see that you know, there's changes afoot with um, the um, data exception. Um, but also I think it's very kind of the, the fact it's hard to pin down also makes it interesting. So every inquiry really is an opportunity to learn. And I think that was in, in the chat earlier on. Um, everything that I, every question I, I answer is kind of building that knowledge and building um, that kind of bank to, to draw upon for future queries. And I think probably the difference now um, from when I started a couple of years ago is that I know now that it's okay to not have the answer because often there isn't a, a definite answer. Um, it depends on a whole range of things, including the element of risk that as an institution we're prepared to take. So I think that's, that's part of the thing is I'm now more comfortable in going, well, this is my take on it, but um, you know, it's, it's open, it's a gray area is one of my favorite, um, favorite kind of phrases. Okay. I just wanted to close by just giving a mention actually to the copyright community who many of whom are here today um, and just to say thank you really to everyone who's on list copy seek um, so those who ask questions and those who answer them um, i've lost count of the times that someone's asked a question and then maybe a month or two down the line i get something very similar and uh, in the back of my mind i remember seeing it somewhere and um, i go back and delve into the archive and and that's really helpful um, in terms of helping me um, both with my knowledge and to answer the queries that I get. Um, but thanks also to those of you who don't look. Um, so you flag up the new resources, you know, you broadcast things on Twitter and, and on your blog. Um, it's been incredibly helpful and I think I would have been um, completely lost without you. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. It's really lovely, really heartening to hear as well some of the things you've been saying about the community. Um, we've got lots of things we'd like to pick up, but um, we should let our, our next speaker, I think, um, come on and do their bit. And then if we could, um, if you could all uh, do uh, stay around for some chat, I think that would be brilliant because I think there's going to be some lots of themes coming out. So our next speaker is uh, Neil Sprunt uh, from the uh, University of Manchester where he's teaching and learning services manager and the copyright manager. So Neil, who needs no introduction really, and that is a hilarious slide. I like it a lot. I like, yes, take Thanks, it away. Jane. I'm glad you said my title so I don't have to spit it out. Um, it's quite so worthy, isn't it? It yeah. is quite worthy. Um, <laughs> So this presentation is actually quite timely because um, it's nearly 10 years to the day where I started my copyright journey. And boy, has it been a journey. I had hair when it first started. Um, so my role has developed quite a lot over those 10 years, but it's only been in the last year that I've actually had copyright in my job description, let alone my actual job title and it only makes up uh, point 0.2 of my overall role. So my role is basically, I'm, I'm mainly the contact for everything to do with copyright at the University of Manchester now, to sum it up. But how did it all start? Well, it all began when I missed a meeting. So to give you a bit of context, um, the University of Manchester was audited by the CLA back in 2011. This was following some quite sort of dubious uh, activities and practices by a number of academic staff at the university, including posting and uploading entire books onto Blackboard and to uh, personal blogs and things like that. 
anyway, we were audited. Um, we were had our wrists slapped by the CLA, and they told us that basically we needed to work harder as an institution in making our students and staff um, more aware of the copyright responsibilities that they had. At the same time as this was going on, um, there was a library restructure taking place, and the teaching and learning students team was being formed as part of that as we moved away from subject teams to a more functional model. So the uh, university decided that the library should be the place where copyright awareness and a copyright service existed. The library decided that the teaching and learning students team is where it should sit. And I was on holiday in Sicily and uh, missed our first team meeting where all our roles were given out. And I imagine, with a, no, no one's told me this, but copyright was probably last out of the bag and no one wanted to do it. And I was given the honor. And in a strange way, it's probably the best thing that could have happened for the university copyright wise, having that CLA audit. And it was certainly the best thing that could have happened to me, although I did not appreciate it at the time. So um, I set about trying to get my head around everything to do with copyright. I had no knowledge of copyright at all. Uh, at the beginning. So there was a lot to learn. Um, so I attended lots of training sessions. Again, people have mentioned Naomi Korn and uh, Charles Oppenheim. And further down the line, I also attended sessions that Jane and Chris uh, delivered too. I read a lot. I tapped into Liz CopySeq again, which was amazingly useful, as everyone knows, as, as a knowledge base more than anything else. But then I had to go, being in a teaching and learning team, and actually do some sort of copyright presentations. And this was quite early on in my tenure. And uh, my first one was to a group of um, life sciences academic staff. And I was kind of tagged on to the end of a, of a presentation about lecture capture. So they were all in a bad place from the very start. Um, and then they had to listen to me um, at the end of that presentation, sort of politely explaining copyright law to them without fully really understanding it all myself. And they were a bit upset. Um, so one of the lines I remember was, uh, do you expect me to just delete all the 47 YouTube videos I have on Blackboard then? Um, which I didn't really have an answer for. He was like, kind of, you know, don't shoot the messenger, mate. It's not my fault. Um, but that experience did have quite a sort of profound effect on me in terms of how I approached uh, copyright guidance um, from that event onwards. And it became very clear to me that you had to talk about copyright in a way that made it seem like it wasn't a barrier, that it wasn't an obstacle. And we all know this now as sort of copyright literacy and making people have an understanding of the issues around copyright that affect them, but don't make it don't make it all about what you can't do. Try and find solutions. Talk about things like risk management. Try and make it understandable. And being in the teaching and learning and students team, obviously that was a big part of my remit. So we, I set about trying to create a lot of online content to help with this. So copyright information on our web pages was all over the place. Um, so I tried to bring it into one LibGuide. Um, I tried to structure it based on users. So it made it, again, easier to find information. Tried to make the language more understandable. Also developed a few sort of copyright resources that a staff and student could use. And it kind of, it's developed from there. To be able to do all this, though, I needed a very solid support structure. So there was myself in the copyright guidance service, but we also had um, a copyright operations group within the university, which sort of over, was overarching, developed copyright policy, et cetera, et cetera. And that was made up of legal affairs, media services, e-learning teams, teaching and learning offices, all sorts of different people from across the university. And we don't have that anymore because we put so much in place that now really all the legacy of that group is that it's myself and the legal affairs team. So university lawyers who have a really, really good relationship 
and we also work with the commercialization wing of um, IP at the university, which is known as the Innovation Factory. And I also built up lots of good relationships with other teams in the library. Um, so reading list teams, special collections, um, and research services, scholarly comms, and that was also really useful. And outside of um, the library and the university, there's also all the groups that um, I've been involved with in terms of the sector. So I started off in the SCOML group, which is no more, um, but that also got me involved in um, other groups such as obviously CMAC with Jane, Chris and Kate, etc. And I'm also a co-chair for the Academic Libraries North Community of Practice group and a member of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interests group too. And I've learned so much from being on these groups. Um, and what I have learned, I've been able to take away and actually apply in my in my day to day job as well, which has been incredibly valuable. So overall, what have I learned? Um, well, I've learned that you shouldn't miss your first team meeting. That's one thing. Um, but I think to reiterate what um, Wendy and uh, Chris have said, attending lots of conferences, trying to absorb information, reading, uh, going to different training sessions, but realizing at the same time that even though you're absorbing a lot of information, you can't remember it all. Building relationships has been really important for me, um, especially within my own institution. So I think I've communicated well with the people that I work with. Um, I've also built these relationships across uh, the university, which, you know, University of Manchester is a big institution. So communication channels don't always work particularly well, but I think we now have something in place which work, does work in terms of copyright. Tapping into communities of practice is just a given. We wouldn't be on this webinar um, now if we didn't um, think that was a good thing. Asking questions, I mean, this has been brought up already. So again, it's a broader community of practice with Liz CopySeq, um, but learning from experience as well. So when I encountered that lynch mob from uh, Life Sciences, um, I still took a lot from that, even though it wasn't the nicest of experiences at the time. And just mentioning imposter syndrome, it's been spoke about already, but copyright is quite a daunting topic. Um, but um, I think as a community, we should appreciate them. We know a lot more than we probably think we do. And we are experts in this field. And even if we don't remember, or we can't think about everything, we have a really strong sort of network behind us. So that's really good. Okay. That's me done, thank you. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you, Neil. That's really, really good to it hear, It was isn't fantastic, it? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And a, a great, uh, you know, once again, three talks, I think that really complement each other really well. Just to say, Neil, for the record, the work that you did at Manchester was, you know, one that I followed when I was building things up at Kent as well. You were clearly taking a lead in that. Mm -hmm. Something I saw when I did my, dissertation um, and talking to people throughout the sector it is those institutions that manage to bolt together those collaborations within uh, the organization and actually get something really meaningful happening that allows you to, to have that culture change that then avoids those those kind of example situations where you've got people and it's quite antagonistic we've I think everybody we're seeing comments there uh, we mm. know we've been in those situations and some of it is the situation that you create around trying to resolve that by by changing the sort of the culture mm. but some of it is like you say it's learning isn't it you, you, you mm. kind of have to go through that to know how to handle those situations we've got loads of nice comments coming up as well so really yeah really great all of you we have got five minutes for questions though yes. so um if you if you've got things you want to ask we've still got chris wendy and uh, obviously neil uh, there with us so um and i don't know if you want to ask a generic question to kick things off of all of our speakers I've, chris i've got a, an initial question i wouldn't mind if all speakers could reflect on whether the background that you came from you think had an impact on how you initially addressed copyright so i'm thinking about the fact that Wendy, you're from a law library background and whether 
you it, it is a, a sort of law based looking at legislation legalistic thing is it helpful is it helpful in which way and, and then neil you know teaching and learning from that perspective uh, and then chris i guess from not really being within uh, but, but I think maybe the, the, the as, history as and doing yeah, the research. Yeah, absolutely, being a, being a humanities researcher yourself and being very much in that mindset. So, um, I mean, Wendy, do you want to, to, to kick us off with that a reflection on? I can. I don't know if you can hear that they're, <laughs> they're just chopping up trees again. Um, it's fine. Yeah, it's no, fine. we're not here. No, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, I think it probably was helpful, is helpful, actually. I think just knowing how legal information works you know the relationship between you know secondary uh, primary and secondary legislation and cases and how it all fits together um i think that has been useful um i would say actually just also just being a subject librarian um that background is also useful because part of that role has always been liaison and reaching out to people and trying to build relationships and i think probably that aspect has also been useful um and certainly I feel slightly cheated having started in the pandemic because certainly if I'd started in normal times, I would have been going out to have coffee with people and those kinds of things in a way I wasn't able to. So I think that's just delayed building those relationships and they are getting going now, but I think it's just taken a bit longer um, to get yeah. those going. So I think it's a mixture of the subject knowledge and actually that, that experience of liaison has, has been useful. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. What, what about Chris? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's kind of for me, it was kind of like this kind of like a mixture of things going on because as a historian, certainly as a student, I was a bit blasé towards things like copyright. It just didn't enter the equation. I mean, particularly in the area that I was sort of occupying, it was sort of like, oh, I'm quoting from a text. That's fine. That's what we do. You know, I'm, I'm going to archives and looking at things published by people who have been dead for hundreds of years, you know no yeah, issues there yeah. it didn't really factor into my sort of my working process but on the flip side of that now that i am sort of engaged with that space i actually i think i mentioned to chris when 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 he was still at kent that cerebrally i actually find that there's like quite a lot of similarity in terms of the method of thinking and the way that you look at the issues uh in copyright that you would as a historian i mean it, it it's it's because there are those gray areas it's not necessarily a case of right and wrong black and white you know you can give concrete and firm answers you have to you have to build a case and make it compelling and and in some influence other people of the advice uh, and the benefit of the guidance that you're giving them rather than saying oh it's x or y you know and mm. i find that quite similar to sort of what you would do as a historian you know it, it's compelling a viewpoint uh, and i think yeah, that's very right advice is about too yeah 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 no i i, I think as a, a history graduate myself i think i i agree with you it is always you know the 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 kind of challenging gray area doesn't seem to be a problem when you you're a historian because you're like yeah but that's what we're always doing weighing stuff up and and trying to kind of work it out on the balance of you know our best judgment um, should we go to well, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so Neil, what, what do you think from your perspective of, and the other things you do as teaching learning librarian? Yeah. Um, well, I think I alluded to it in the presentation, but um, it's taking that sort of teaching and learning ethos into my copyright work, which is, which wasn't the hardest part, to be honest with you, it, because, I mean, the information that I had to deal with when I first started the job, looking at different web pages that were scattered all over the library website and the university website, it was all really detailed and there was lots of language in it used that was totally, no one would be able to understand it. Um, it was understanding that a lot of um, students and especially members of academic staff they don't want to know about the details. They just want an answer. They just want a solution to the problem that they have that copyright is potentially blocking. And so it was just trying to make everything more understandable and explaining things in a way that they understood and trying not to put barriers up and, and trying to enable them to do their jobs properly, but um, and not letting copyright get in the way. Yeah, yeah. 
We've we've actually got a question that's come up in the chat from um, Inga Lil, who's joining us this morning from Sweden. Mm -hmm. Lovely to see you, Inga Lil. Do you, I don't know if you want to come on the mic and ask your question, or would you rather I just read it out in the interest of time? It's, but it's it's lovely to have you here, Inga Lil. Maybe you might want to respond in a moment. She said, being a copyright specialist is a lonely job. How can you share your knowledge with library colleagues and make them less frightened? Anybody like to respond to that, Neil? I, I agree. It, I agree. It can be a lonely job, but it doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. I think, luckily, I have a team of 27 people, so at least one or two of them have <laughs> um, <laughs> shown an interest in helping me out with some copyright work. Um, and like I said in my presentation, it's building relationships, not just within the library, but across the university has has been absolutely crucial if i hadn't done that and i hadn't have didn't have these mechanisms and channels to communicate with them it would be a really lonely job and i would have struggled yeah chris are you you're nodding i think there uh, would you agree yeah. yeah no i think what neil said about like especially in terms of you know trying to make the advice and the guidance that you give people accessible and, and not this sort of impenetrable daunting sort of you know mass of of imposing law i think and i i, I think you know that helps the, the whoever's come to you with the question because you know you're you're presenting it in layperson's terms as much as you can and, and i and i also think that that approach certainly has helped me understand the issues that i'm i'm confronting and the, the questions mm. that i'm getting because you know i am not like an expert in this space yet I, you know no, um, no, no, and no. I, I think reducing it down to the things that someone who's asking a question would understand help helps me in terms of my own development too but you're right i suppose it can be a, a bit of a lonely space too especially now that i don't have chris <laughs> so, uh, yeah no it can be but yeah i would say try to be accessible and friendly would probably be yeah my approach thank you wendy do you want to comment on that question at all um, yeah, no, I, I've, this is actually something I've said in, in one to ones that sometimes I felt quite isolated, actually. And again, that I think mm. particularly with being online and, and so on. Um, but sort of practical things we've done, we've got uh, just a, an LSE wide teams group that's a copyright group. So um, it's a lot of it is me <laughs> posting, but, you know, there's some kind of, you know, idea of sharing um, issues and knowledge and so on there. Um, and also just in a library context, we do, we've just had um, a, so some lightning talks. We had a whole kind of sort of session on copyright. So where different people from within the library talked about how copyright had impacted their work. And I think oh, that, wow. that, that sharing of kind of experience actually made everyone realize a, how pervasive copyright is, but also helped people speaking about it to feel that they knew, at least in their area, um, more, more about copyright than they realized. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, that that I mean, I I certainly found that you've got to seek out those people that actually do really, you know, want to talk about copyright. And I had a little mm. community of practice when I was at LSE and found that people did start coming out of the woodwork to want to talk about it. Um, so, but yeah, Inga Lil saying she doesn't see herself as an expert, but her colleagues do, and I think that is something I found that sometimes when you're the specialist, mm. there's a tendency for people to just kind of want to you know just pass it to you and we've talked about the hot potato and i think it's what we talked about earlier on in the presentation it doesn't mean you know everything and as you were saying when it doesn't mean that it, it's your take on it and i think that's something that that we jay and i feel as well mm. you know as much as people say well you know everything well we don't know everything it's always mm. you need other people's input into it mm. um so i think it's great that we've had so many examples of how you've all managed to do that in your own way and bringing that in to make it a collective thing. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank gonna, you. Yeah, really enjoyed that. It was a brilliant, uh, yet again, three excellent presentations. So thank you again. I'm sure and we're getting lovely comments yeah. from, from everyone there. Um, so what we're going to do now, we are at time with the uh, presentation. So just a reminder that uh, there is no webinar in August. We have provisionally looking at a couple of dates in September, but we're very aware that Ice Pops is happening. And it may be that we decide that- We run an, a webinar after Ice Pops we run a webinar with some highlights. Maybe some highlights from Ice Pops. We're going to yeah. check when we've actually worked through and not overcommit, we're going to under promise and over deliver on that one, but we are absolutely 
locked in the 7th of October, a discussion on open textbooks uh, with... Um, We've got Dara Snowden from mm -hmm. UCL and yeah. we have Lorna Campbell from the University of Edinburgh talking mm -hmm. about their open textbooks um, programmes. So that should be a really, really interesting session. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So... We're just, we're just at that point, Chris, I think, where uh, we, it's, 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 it's almost time. Get your lighter in the for, air, everybody. For, for, oh, it's, this is just full on top of this. Oh, yeah. yeah, here we go, right. So we've written a jingle which is about staying around and, and, everyone and, and it prompts everyone to leave. But that's <laughs> it is entirely the best, the best voluntary. Well, the best yeah. people well, what, what, what nugget have you got through the end of... Oh, oh my one, last, one thing. last thing. My one last thing. It is Jane Secker's <laughs> Telly Snaps. Okay. I, have a, I, I, I would like to discuss now with the people that have remained what they think of the copyright implications of what I'm doing. I, I have I have here copyright implications or what the value is at all doing what you're <laughs> doing, which is just taking pictures. Well, that so I have taken some stills from yes get back yes which is obviously on the Disney Channel which okay. is so a subscription service and I have included them as excerpts in the slide. I am also compiling my own tele snaps for future because you know in case recording becomes unavailable in any other medium. I will have this Google folder of, of, of you know, telly snaps that show pivotal moments. I've mm. got uh, the Eurovision there. I've actually got some great ones from the Jubilee as well. I mean, it, in some ways, it's a bit like a scrapbook of your life because it, it shows is. you when you were watching <laughs> something at the time. Yes. So anyone like to venture an opinion? Neil, what Wendy, are you doing Chris? with the slides? What am I what doing, doing with, well, with them? Why am I doing it? What are you doing with them? I want to, well, I've put them into, look here, I've put them on a slide. You just put them on a slide, to, but you're not actually no, making just, these available, are you? No, I'm not making them you're available. You're just for your own, your own personal amusement. I, so is, something like a digital scrapbook yes. of your audio visual yes. entertainment experience. Yes, yes. It all sounds I'm, very I'm not having my mum as well, where there's nice pictures of Paul McCartney. Yeah. I don't know if that counts as some sort of, you know, I am sharing with another person. I think you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, still uh, we are still recording. Okay, we're still yeah, recording. we've had it on the record. Fair That's enough. it. We're fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we'll stop the recording. That wasn't then. me that said that. No, 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 no. no. I, I just want to no. say, for the record, I occasionally I have, of course, sometimes to mock you in the things that you do. You, you and mean, I was mocking you about this when we were talking to Mark Lewis, and he says, "Well, oh, I do the same thing." Yes. So yeah. it's like, okay, I stand corrected. Two, By two, two big against, brains. Two big brains against one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There so we are. I... Yeah. One tiny brain. Mm. Yeah. Two big brains against one tiny brain. Well, leave it there. I think we'll stop the recording now. That's stopping sharing. Okay. All right. We'll stop sharing <laughs> and we'll stop recording. Bye. <laughs> I can't stop the recording. No, you can't, can you? No. Can you stop the recording? No, I'm not on the call anymore. <laughs> I have to click the three lines. The hamburger at the top left. Here we go, look, it's just over there. <laughs> there. It's not there.